Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Mike Warren. That's Jonah Goldberg. That's Steve Hayes. That's Chris Steyerwalt. We'll be talking about the election that nobody asked for. <laughs> We've got so many polls to discuss, each one more depressing than the last. Chris Steyerwalt's already excited about it. We'll be also talking about the migrant crisis and what's going on in New York City. And of course, a look at now 22 years since 9-11, since the September 11th attacks. We'll be talking about all of that on the show. Take a listen. Okay, let's dive in with the election. Again, the election nobody asked for, nobody wanted. Uh, We've got a bunch of polls. I feel like we should start with the polls because there is a new CNN poll that tells us some things that we already learned from an earlier this week Wall Street Journal poll. It's a close general election race. Uh, If it's Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, essentially a, uh, a statistical tie. And you notice I led with that and not anything about the Republican primary that is supposedly still going on because Donald Trump is so far ahead, both in the journal and uh, in the CNN polls. Uh, Steve, let's start with you. What do we, what should we make? Let's, should we start with the CNN poll? I mean, what is it, 47 47 Biden and Trump this is a this is a dead heat should we talk at all about the Republican primary or should we just jump into the general election so, so the news uh, uh, in this poll about the Republican primary is that Nikki Haley uh, would beat Biden in a head-to-head matchup by I believe it's six points um, other Republican candidates do well the only Republican losing to Joe Biden in a head-to-head matchup is Vivek Ramaswamy So that's sort of the top line on the general election. What I find the most interesting, though, are the findings on Joe Biden. And they're dismal. If you're a Democrat, you have to be at least concerned, maybe panicked. Um, Questions, is Joe Biden somebody you are proud to have as president? 37% of Democrats say that that's not the case. 70% of independents say that they're not proud of having Joe Biden as president. 50% of Democrats, 77% of independents say Biden does not have the stamina and sharpness to serve effectively as president. And 67% of Dem or Dem-leaning voters say they prefer someone not named Biden as their nominee. I'm paraphrasing from Aaron Blake's analysis uh, at the Washington Post. But that's a jump from 54%. Uh, in March. Those are horrendous, horrendous numbers for Joe Biden. I think what's interesting is this split that you're seeing among what you're you're hearing from rank and file Democratic voters, as reflected in this poll, as reflected in the Wall Street Journal poll, um, where I believe it was 70 percent of of Democrats said that they were, were not excited about Joe Biden being their party's nominee, and what you're hearing from professional Democrats. Um, There's a story out in Semaphore this morning that's sort of the perfect um, bracket to this. all of these uh, stories about the polls that quotes a bunch of Democratic strategists and pollsters saying, "Eh, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You know, people aren't focused on the race. People are excited about abortion and the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Uh, We haven't spent enough money. Uh, boosting Joe Biden, all of these things that strike me as as whistling past the graveyard. This is a serious problem for Democrats. Joe Biden is among the most vulnerable incumbents, I think, in recent memory. And if they don't sort of take it seriously, uh, I think it, it could be a problem. Yeah, I mean, this CNN poll sort of underscores what the journal poll uh, that from earlier this week uh, showed us, particularly when you compare it uh, compare the findings on a s- number of questions with Donald Trump. So I'm just going through this uh, from the journal poll. Uh, 
More than 70% say Joe Biden is too old to run for president. Uh, he's, he's several points, uh, se- I should say, uh, several, uh, uh, you know, it's almost 25 points ahead of Donald Trump on that. Um, he, he scores below Donald Trump on the question of whether Biden is mentally up for the job as president. Um, he's, he's basically neck and neck on the question of whether Biden cares about people like you. Uh, he's behind Trump on the question of whether he has a vision for the future and on a strong record of accomplishments for president on a couple of sort of personal things. Biden is better than Trump. Not much better. Uh, people say he's more honest than they say Trump is. Uh, they say he's more likable than Trump is. So even on a sort of head to head between Biden and Trump, not just with Democrats, but in a general election, uh, Biden's in big trouble. Chris, uh, how seriously should we take this? Should Democrats, professional Democrats, be a little more realistic? Or are they seeing something beyond the horizon here that, that mere polls and, 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 and us pundits are, are missing? Uh, the essential question in politics and life, or what? And the, there's not an or what for Democrats, right? Um, Republicans keep saying, well, they're going to put Michelle Obama in. They're going to do that. They're going to swap Biden out. Da, 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 da. Joe Biden's the incumbent president. He's seeking reelection. There is no one in his party, not Gavin Newsom, not nobody, who is in a position to take Joe Biden on at this point. Now, a lot will change between now and January. Much will, much will transpire. Um, and we don't know what Democrats are betting. I loved um, Jim Messina. I had a thing in Politico this week. Here are the states to watch. Actually, Biden's fine. It's going to be like this. It's going to be like that. And I just, I found it very Messina-esque. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we have the data. We know the secret sauce. We know how to do it. The truth for Democrats is this is a open question. This is a very open question. The preponderance of the evidence suggests that in a head-to-head matchup with Donald Trump, if it were conducted today, that Joe Biden would win. Uh, We have the evidence from the 2022 midterms uh, that were conducted when Joe Biden was very, uh, was unpopular, right? Uh, When when Joe Biden was in at least as much trouble uh, in 2022 as he is now. And while Republicans uh, did win the House, uh, when you look at individual Senate races, you see discerning voters choosing in favor of uh, non goofy uh, Republicans uh, and and rejecting the Mehmet Oz, uh, Carrie Lake, uh, Herschel Walker kind of mega kooks. So the, the the Democrats are probably right, but they're not right by much, and it would not take very much at all to tip this over in the other direction. The problem is, though, and this is where we always end up, what are you going to do about it, right? What what would Democrats, it it is within the power of Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. to change this narrative. He could say, yeah, well, I'm really, this is too, it's too risky for me to do. Uh, I can't do this again. I'm not going to do this again. Uh, And there's plenty of precedent for that from Lyndon Johnson to Rutherford B. Hayes to all kind of folks who said one and done, I'm good. Um, But uh, absent that, I think the Democrats are just going to have to continue whistling past the graveyard or the nursing home, as the case may be, and just figure we're going to have to make the best of this. And by the way, then I'll shut up. The advantage that Democrats have is, is that the bitter, ugly, divisions within the Republican Party that are only just beginning, we've only just begun, will afford them. They're already up on the air in swing states, right? They're already spending money. And if we think back to 2012, what they did to Mitt Romney, while Republicans waited, 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 and weren't spending money in Ohio and the upper Midwest, Democrats got on the air with cheap ads before the peak rates came in and and kept it up. And this is what Democrats can hope this time. So another marginal presidential election, another sort of, you know, uh, two yards in a cloud of dust kind of effort by Democrats. Uh, Jonah, the one thing that we haven't brought up yet here, but that sort of, I, I think, 
Chris's uh, uh, sort of logic leads us to is the effect of all of these uh, legal problems on Donald Trump and the ability for Democrats to really exploit that, uh, whether or not he is, uh, you know, on trial for all of them before the election, he probably won't be. Um, if you dive in, as, as I did into this Wall Street Journal poll, there is a lot of evidence that while Republican primary voters are all rallying to Donald Trump because of uh, these indictments, that that's not what general election voters uh, where they are on this question, they uh, they think these are these cases, these indictments have merit, and Donald Trump is going to be on trial, both sort of metaphorically and actually, at least in one of these cases, before the election. Uh, that's a factor that isn't really you know put into our analysis so far. What do you think that effect is going to be? And will people, voters, look at Biden and say, eh, he's he's at least he's not on trial? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I first of all, just because I, I can't admit to being a broken record unless I replay the same tune a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I think the way to think about this election so far is there are two very weak, very vulnerable incumbents. Word. Historically, incumbents, like if, if you look at Donald Trump as an incumbent, his numbers are very weak for an incumbent much weaker than LBJ's were when he got out of the race, right? Uh, much weaker than George H.W. Bush's were when Pat Buchanan took a swipe at him. But if you look at it as an open field, his numbers are like, oh my gosh, he's crushing this, right? And a lot of people are confused because it is confusing because we've never been in a situation really like this where you have maybe the William Jennings Bryan races were similar in terms of this incumbency, even though you're not an incumbent thing. And Biden is an historically unbelievably weak incumbent too. This is throwing a lot of your conventional punditry playbooks out the window. It's, it's disrupting, you know, the matrix of how Washington normally thinks and talks about this stuff. And it's not the only thing that's doing it. The other thing that's doing it is the thing that you brought up, which is these, these legal cases. I can't remember his name, but I had this really smart guy on my podcast this week talking about this election stuff. And he was making the point that smoking the bandit is wildly underrated. No, he was making the point that accurate, um, accurate. that late deciders, undecideds, independents, the, the people who decide elections ultimately tend not to be very ideological voters. Doesn't mean they're dumb. Doesn't mean they're uninformed. Means they may not be paying attention yet, but you start informing those voters with possibly televised criminal proceedings where the entire country is going to go to go to school on the actual charges against Trump. So you can't talk about peaceful protesters being put in jail without bail, you know, which is what Ramaswamy is saying now. You can't do this was no big deal kind of thing. You can't do this was just free speech arguments. You actually have to deal with the facts of the cases. And my sense is, is that they will have a powerful effect on the people that can still be persuaded. Right. We're, and there are more than enough of them to win an election. But I come back to this basic fundamental problem that is the Kobayashi Maru kind of screw up of all our of normal analysis is that it is very difficult for me to see a way for Donald Trump to win. But it is weirdly easy for me to see a way for Joe Biden to lose. One fall, right? A couple more sort of Mitch McConnell-like episodes or worse which I think are entirely possible. And you can see everything thrown into disarray. This gets us back to the setup of the thing is the election nobody wanted. Nobody wants to see this. And yet both parties are determined, like Colonel Nicholson on Bridget River Kwai, no, we must proceed. We must do this <laughs> thing, regardless of whether it's a terrible idea. It's going to end badly. Let me pick up on some something that Jonah said there, because I think it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you talked a little bit about how there's this conventional analysis coming from the sort of pundit analyst class and media conversations are taking place as if there's a, a competitive primary and the Republican side, and it all feels very much the same, and yet we're living in something close to an unprecedented situation, given the weakness. If you buy Jonah's framing as this uh, sort of dual weak in incumbency battle, what I find totally perplexing, totally perplexing, is the inability or unwillingness of any of the Republican campaigns to make adjustments. I mean, we had Ron DeSantis' campaign now saying for six weeks 
that they were going to reset, that they were going to do things differently. It's the same campaign. I mean, it's mostly the same campaign. He's talking a little bit less about woke stuff, maybe a little bit more about his record, but it's more or less the same campaign. You have seen since the beginning of the Republican primaries, Donald Trump gets stronger. His numbers are better today than they were when this started. Ron DeSantis has dropped, depending on the poll you believe, by just a few points, by double digits. The other candidates have moved up and down sort of in in meaningless numbers. Tim Scott is plus two, Nikki Haley's plus five, you know, Chris Christie's minus one. It doesn't matter. None of this stuff matters. Nobody's close to Donald Trump. You would think if you were advising one of these other campaigns that they might say, hey, all, what we're doing is not working. We should try something radically different. And while I don't think there's an easy answer, it's, there's not an easy path to defeating Donald Trump in a Republican primary. If there were, I suppose somebody might have taken it to this point. But what they're doing isn't working. And even as late as last night in an interview that Ron DeSantis gave to Eric Bowling, and DeSantis keeps going to these places where he gets asked these kinds of questions, and then he feels like he has to give these kind of answers because I think he often feels like he needs to please sort of alt-right crowd, the alt-right interrogators who are, are interviewing him. He's asked this question about the sentences for January 6th. And he goes on and suggests that he thinks many of the January 6th sentences have been too harsh. He sort of sounds an an almost sympathetic note uh, for uh, Enrique Tario, the Proud Boys leader, was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Even if you wanted to sort of make that case, this is not something that's going to separate you from Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the candidate in the race who's January 6th sympathetic. He's raised money for January 6th participants. It's crazy that nobody's doing anything different at all. But but wouldn't that require these candidates to act as if they don't think they have a chance anymore and to take a risk? Because it seems that they all seem to think, they all seem to be acting under the assumption that it remains Trump's party and the only way to win is to get Trump's party on your side. Mike Pence gave this speech this week going after populism in the Republican Party. Maybe a couple of years too late in terms of uh, finding the source of the problem, perhaps, from from his perspective. But notable, um, also notable, I was on the press preview call, along with some of our colleagues, previewing this speech with Pence's advisors. I would say the mood was somber, one of a campaign that maybe sees this as a last stab, a a sort of final push before the Pence campaign wraps things up, maybe not next week, but maybe in a couple months. This was an effort by uh, a candidate who sort of is acting as if he's not going to win, but he's going to try to take a stand. Populism is not the way forward. Old school conservatism, maybe not the best messenger for this, Mike Pence serving four years alongside Donald Trump. But Jonah, Chris, I mean, what what do we think of this speech? Is it, is it, Important for candidates like Pence to to plant a flag? Is there some kind of way in which a speech like this helps, maybe not Pence, but somebody else if they take up the flag? Uh, What do we think? Uh, Well, um, your framing uh, in your your elegant tease uh, of what the condition of the Republican Party is in is correct, right? Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. He is the president in exile in the minds of many Republicans. And the same factors that help incumbent presidents help Donald Trump, right? The Republican Party nominating process and the attitude of many Republicans is to do what? Protect the front runner. You got to protect the front runner. You got to keep this guy intact. Um, And Bob Dole at 96, George H.W. Bush, uh, George W. Bush, after he lost to John McCain in New Hampshire, we see again and again and again the Republicans' willingness to, and I, I think we have to remember the distribution of the Trump vote. A third or so of the Republican Party, MAGA, they're in, they like it, they want it. A quarter of the Republican Party, anti, right? 
I think it was Whit Ayers, but some, as somebody said that I steal from frequently, there's three branches of the Republican Party, uh, always Trump, never Trump, and always Republican. And those always Republican voters want to win, they want to defeat Joe Biden, and they dislike the idea of an ugly primary contest, right? They don't want that to happen. For DeSantis, for Ronnie D, what's the problem? He picked up Ted Cruz's campaign where Ted Cruz left off, including with some of the same people, which is, I'm going to fly behind enemy lines and and blow up Donald Trump's coalition, and I will take my constituency out of the MAGA third, right? Which was dumb. And he tried to run as an incumbent. He tried to, look, he'd never run for national office. uh, And he didn't have a a broad enough footprint in the Republican Party to even think about trying to run and clear the field. I have so much money. I have so much support. I have so many endorsements. No one can, everybody else better get out of the race. That was foolhardy even without what Jonah correctly describes as a de facto incumbent in the race. So DeSantis tried and he got blowed up, right? He, he went in after Trump. I'm going to do it. And now he is limping back. I, I will say, Jeff Rowe, I wish that I had the chutzpah of his super PAC director, who as Ron DeSantis' campaign is on fire and tumbling down the side of a hill. I need $50 million dollars right away. What I need you to do, yeah, I also (laughs) can dramatically change the trajectory of the race if you give me $50 million in the next two weeks. So that's DeSantis's failure. I think what Pence is doing is the same thing that Nikki Haley's doing and the same thing that Tim Scott has attempted to and so far failed to do, which is start somewhere. When you're a challenger, you've got to start somewhere. You have to begin the way that people win nominations is they have solid support in one faction of the party and then they work through attraction to persuade persuadables, right? So what has to happen if Donald Trump is not going to be the nominee? You need someone who can unite the quarter of anti-Trump and start nicking away at the persuadables, right? And that looks like uh, a win. Let's So here's the lower probability scenario. Iowa says, I can't help myself. I love Mike Pence. I love Mike Pence. I, I, this guy, I, I love him. And it would be in keeping with Iowa's character to defy the rest of the party and put forward. A, and, and that's where he's got to deal with Nikki Haley. And that's where he's got to deal with Tim Scott, particularly Scott, who looks a lot like the kind of candidate that Iowa voters, sincere Christians in Iowa, uh, and traditional conservatives in Iowa would say, we don't care what the rest of the country says, we're giving this guy a shot. So let's imagine that a Pence or a Tim Scott can do that. Let's also imagine that New Hampshire does what it likes to do, which is also to, with a lot of independent voters in the Republican primary with no real contest on the Democratic side, put its thumb in the eye of Iowa and the rest of the country by picking Chris Christie. You know what, guys? We don't care. We don't care. We're doing this. And then you have a 30-day period, 32-day period, until South Carolina. What happens in that space, I don't know. So the way I look at it is Mike Pence is acting rationally, which is, as Kevin Williamson's great piece, The Whited Sepulchre, uh, about Mike Pence points out, Mike Pence is trying to appeal to traditional conservatives, to small government, constitutional conservatives, that his... uh, that his conversion on January 6th to his old self, his reversion to the old kind of small government, Reaganite, traditional conservative was real and it will stick. I can't improve on Chris's punditry there, but on on the substance of the Mike Pence speech, there was a little debate inside the the salon that is the Dispatch's (laughs) Slack channel. (laughs) Steve's position, I I don't want to mischaracterize it, but I think this is fair to say is, all things being equal, I prefer to hear politicians change to the right position than stick with the wrong position. That's right. right. And I think Pence's position is correct. I'm very tempted to go on a long riff about Aesop's fable with the, the scorpion and the frog, though, because here you have Mike Pence riding the scorpion, praising the scorpion's broad-shouldered leadership for years. 
and then crossing many rivers, and then saying, but for this one day, scorpions are awesome, but now scorpions pose a huge peril to the Republican Party and to conservatism generally. But I think the, the scorpion frog thing is a little played out. So instead, I will quote Professor Farnsworth from Futurama, who said, everybody's in favor of saving Hitler's brain, but you put it in the body of a great white shark and, oh, you've gone too far. Um, like the populism that I have been railing against for 15 years has gotten us into this incredibly crappy situation. People, Mitt, Mitt Romney's speech in 2016 was preferable to me, but like the populism, the populism has swamped the Republican Party. It is the de facto ideology of Fox News, never mind OAN and that other one. News News Max. Max. I mean, I, I, how many times have Steve and I talked about this on here about how when National Review came on with the against Trump issue, I watched Fox all day long. This is back when I was a Fox contributor, and I think so was Rich. One host after another, including people like Chris Wallace, would say, who does National Review think it is to tell voters who to vote for? What? That is what National Review is. It's like that's what National Review does. Is it endorses candidates, it opposes candidates, it criticizes candidates. That's what it's been doing for since 1955. And people are suddenly shocked. But this attitude of the masses are always right and I must go with them for I am their leader suffuses the Republican Party. Look at the grief I got about talking about small donors a couple of weeks ago. Everyone lost, well, a lot of people lost their minds about how ridiculous and elitist this position was. This is standard boilerplate conservatism, you know, circa 2015. And so the problem for Pence, it seems to me, is that he is just not a persuasive messenger, even if I agree with the message. Just the idea that somehow all of a sudden he's realizing the problems with populism and how populism isn't conservatism when he, a former radio show host, lion, I was on a panel with Mike Pence in 2000, I think, no, in 2010, discussing populism and politics. And he was on the pro-populism side and I was on the anti side. I, I, I want to celebrate him for saying it. It just does not feel like it's driven by courage. It feels like it's driven by desperation and I think people can smell it. But I, yes, but also what, Speaking of scorpions and frogs or great white sharks with Hitler's brain, what Mike Pence has demonstrated a willingness to do is do what he thinks people want him to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so he thinks what, he thinks that where, where the voters are and he wants to, and he wants to go be with him. And that's what Ron DeSantis did. That's what, that's with the exception maybe of Scott and only moderately, that's what Nikki Haley did. Republicans went and lined up over around. They said, look, we're going to suck up to Trump's voters. We're going to, and I always date this back to the birtherism Mm -hmm. as the emergence of, and whether it was Boehner or whomever that was like, well, I don't know. I don't want to get into a lot of that. I'm not, I I don't want to talk about that. You know, whatever. Hillary Clinton's famous asked whether Barack Obama was a Christian. And she said, well, he says he is. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. (laughs) That that sort of attitude within the Republican Party around the allegation that Barack Obama was a secret Muslim from Kenya, that Republicans said, look, we're just going to have to indulge the kooks of the internet. We're going to have to go along with this for a while and not offend them. But at a certain point, of course, you get to, okay, well, now, now what are we going to do? If, if, the, if the Hitler brain shark is chomping the party to bits, what are we going to do? And then, you, and then you move in the other direction. I think for, for Pence, his biggest problem is the gap between Donald Trump should never be president ever again. He should never be allowed to hold the office of the presidency. And I will support the nominee of the Republican right. Party. Right. That's, the, that's his real hard spot. And the, the spot, Mike, that would represent acceptance of defeat for Mike Pence or acceptance of very likely defeat would be the moment that Pence said, yeah, you know what? I won't vote or support Donald Trump if he is the nominee uh, because he knows what that means and he knows what that entails. Steve, quickly, any thoughts on on the Pence speech or on sort of 
the it, it, the the diagnosis for what's ailing the Republican Party? Yeah, I mean, I guess I come down in a slightly different place than, than Jonah does on sort of what Mike Pence actually believes. I, I guess I I view um, notwithstanding the, the you know what he was the comments he was making in 2010 and his his history as a talk radio host. I mean, I do think that Mike Pence sort of fundamentally, like you strip away everything else, is a Reagan conservative. Like, I think he's a small government movement conservative more than he is a friend to Just modern record, populism. Okay. More than, more than he is. I mean, I think like so many people in the Republican Party, as, as Chris said, and in the conservative media and the commentariat, there was this willingness to engage or indulge populist moments in modern conservatism I think in part because nobody thought it would become this, right? I mean, it was, you know, you didn't, people didn't smack down the, 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 the Obama from Kenya stuff because it just seemed like it was going to go, it wasn't going to go anywhere. I think Pence maybe was guilty of that back in the day and certainly, you know, gave voice to a set of views that combined sort of Trumpy populism and traditional movement conservatism. And in fact, when we asked him about this, when he was on this podcast back in April, yeah, we we put the question to him and said, you know, is this, is this still a Republican party in which a Mike Pence who's running as a Reagan conservative can be competitive when you now have huge swaths of the party sort of mocking what they call zombie Reaganism? You know, he gave an answer that was certainly different in tone. And I think in substance as well from the speech that he gave yesterday. If, if you listen to the arguments that are made really by, you know, nationalist conservatives, the, the populist wing, the ever-growing populist wing of the Republican Party, they talk about Ronald Reagan in derisive terms. They have this, this phrase, zombie Reaganism, to denigrate elected Republicans like you who are making the arguments that would resonate with people who are supporters of Ronald Reagan. That's not a small group. I mean, don't you think that's you know, there's an argument that that's the majority of the Republican Party today? All, all, I, all I can tell you is, yeah, you know, I spoke at more uh, Trump rallies than I can remember. And uh, generally just before the headliner. And I talked about a strong national defense, about American leadership in the world, about standing with our allies, standing up to our enemies. I talked about less taxes, less regulation, American growth, fiscal responsibility. I talked about conservatives on our courts, traditional values. And, and look, I may not be the most scintillating speaker in the world, but the roof blew off every time I talked about these things. This is a movement that's, I believe in my heart of hearts, is still animated by the same things. Now, I believe that, that Donald Trump added to those things. I really do. I think, I think we changed the national consensus on China. I think the American people understand that. I think we added that border security is national security, and the American people in our movement have rallied around that principle. Also, I think we've added the notion that, that trade has to be fair uh, to the American people and to American workers, as well as free. Uh, but at the core of the movement, I think it's all still the same, Steve. His answer then was sort of, I, we've done this, you know, we can combine the two. And his answer yesterday was, these are unbridgeable gaps. I, look, I'm, I, I'm happy anytime anybody is making a case for small government uh, conservatism, classical liberalism, the, the way that I see it, the way that I define it. So I'm happy to have Mike Pence make that case. I hope that we have more people join him soon. And let me I'll just say, I know you're trying to segue us onward, but let me just say, Mike Pence isn't against populism, right? He says he's against populism because he's trying to catch DeSantis and uh, Vivek Ramaswamy in one, in, one, in one stroke. But Mike Pence is trying to be a populist, which is to say he is trying to unite a minority against what he and its members see as the abuses and depredations of the ruling class in his party. That's exactly what Mike Pence is trying to do. He is trying to bring together a committed minority that will then attack the people in power. And it's not populism that Mike Pence is is going after. He's going after kookism or nationalism or pandering or whatever else. But he is by definition, engaged in a populist campaign. It's just that the kookism is the establishment. 
uh, right. in the party. That, that, the, the, the thing, and I've said it so many times before, the purpose of the Pittsburgh Steelers is not to run a wishbone offense. The purpose of the Pittsburgh Steelers is to win football games. And the point of the Republican Party is to try to win elections. And when people get in charge of it, right, they're going to win it whatever with whatever kind of offense or defense they prefer to have. There is very little ideological overlay with either of the parties. Yep. Well, let's talk a little bit about one issue that does animate populism and does sort of give rise to populism, which is immigration and migration, because there is a crisis, uh, a sort of political debate that doesn't really seem to be permeating in Washington, but is going on in border states and in big cities. We should play this audio from Mayor Adams in New York City. And let me tell you something, New Yorkers, never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. Destroy New York City. We're getting 10,000 migrants a month. One time we were just in Venezuela. Now we're getting Ecuador. Now we're getting Russian speaking coming through Mexico. Now we're getting uh, Western Africa. Now we're getting people from all over the globe have made their minds up that they're going to come through the southern part of the border and come into New York City. And everyone is saying it's New York City's problem. Every community in this city is going to be impacted. We got a $12 billion deficit that we're going to have to cut. Every service in this city is going to be impacted. All of us. Steve, this was a sort of remarkable moment, uh, a, a town hall happening in New York where, where Eric Adams, a Democrat, the Democratic mayor of New York City, uh, warning the city about what could happen. Um, what are your thoughts on this moment and, uh, and what should we be watching? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to watch this. I mean, this is, I mean, there's, a, there's a substantive question here. Um, what do you do? You know, as, as Eric Adams said, you've got potentially 120,000, 110,000 new migrants arriving in, projected over the next year. Undoubtedly, that will at least stress the city's systems, welfare systems, the schools, um, you know, medical systems, what have you. There's the substantive question, what the heck do you do? Certainly, it's the case that Eric Adams and, and other Democrats by the way, think that the Biden administration hasn't done much. When they've pressed the Biden administration on this, for a long time they didn't get an answer, and then they got an answer in, a, in the form of a letter that Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas sent, effectively saying, like, ah, there are some structural issues with the city's response, so throwing the blame back on the cities, which further uh, frustrated these Democrats. It doesn't seem as though the Biden administration wants to take a very forward-leaning role in addressing these problems, perhaps mindful of not angering a base of the Democratic Party that's more sympathetic to migrants than perhaps Republicans um, were more open to these places being continuing to be sanctuary cities, sanctuary states than Republicans are. The politics of this are very interesting because you've had Democrats in districts that, that Biden won, competitive districts, who have begun voicing their frustrations with the administration in very public ways, not unlike the way that we just heard from Eric Adams. And, you know, as this grows, as the problem increases, or even if it just stays the same, you can see this being a real complicating factor for Democrats running in 2024, much the way that crime has become a, a big issue that doesn't get a ton of attention um, or doesn't get the kind of attention it, it might um, outside of sort of Fox and conservative media, one suspects that this will matter to people. There was a Siena poll just to, to support that final point. I don't have it in front of me, but it was something like 82% of New York residents said that they regard this migrant crisis as a serious problem. 82%. I mean, that's a, that's a huge number and suggests this is not something that's going to simply disappear. To bring it back to the politics here, Mayor Adams did have some blame for Greg Abbott, the Republican governor of Texas, saying essentially he started it. He and other 
uh, red state governors, uh, Ron DeSantis, another one, um, sending migrants to these sanctuary cities. Um, and then he did segue into saying, you know, we're also getting no support, uh, you know, essentially putting blame on the Biden administration as well. Uh, is there a drawback here for Republicans trying to, I mean, th- there was a sense in the mainstream media coverage of this when this started a couple of years ago that Republicans would suffer uh, uh, by doing this um, because, you know, it it, it it seemed inhumane. It seemed like it was cruel. Uh, but Adam seemed to be suggesting this is a bigger problem. And 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 Steve, you, you mentioned that Siena poll. Um, this is a problem that you know, even residents of blue state uh, and and blue cities uh, recognize uh, what's how how this break down for Republicans is this a boon for whoever wins that Republican nomination in twenty twenty four? I criticize using human beings as props, and I will continue to you to criticize that. That said, there were a lot of responsible ways of doing this. Doug Ducey did it. Worked with people. Told them, hey, we put them on the bus, meet them here. Blah 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 blah. I didn't like the way that DeSantis did it too much, but regardless, let's just put that aside. This is one of the most wildly successful political stunts in American history, and deservedly so, because it was consonant with an important policy point, which is that it is outrageous to expect border states and border communities to shoulder massive burdens of illegal immigrants, swarm in refugees or asylum seekers, whatever you want to call them, coming into their communities with little to no help from the federal government or or insufficient help from the federal government and then call them bigots for complaining and xenophobes for complaining about this. And so these northern cities that call themselves sanctuary cities that had lots of politicians calling southern politicians, border state politicians, bigots, um, said, let's see how you like it and sent these guys up there. And it turned out they can't say it flat out but all of these Democratic politicians suddenly agree with the basic policy position, maybe not the rhetoric, but the basic policy position of the governors of Texas and Arizona and so on. It's good for the policy climate, regardless of what you think about the politics of it. And I think it's good for the Republicans in the politi- in pol- political ways for all sorts of reasons. But the chief one being, look, the Democrats almost took, you know, almost held on to the House in 2022 in part because they, uh, because, you know, these seats in places like New York State. It is entirely conceivable to me that if you run sort of non-Trumpy or quasi-Trumpy or Pence-like, you know, pre-January 6th candidates in places like New York, maybe Illinois, where this immigration stuff is very unpopular as well, um, New Jersey, you can pick up a handful of seats that otherwise should go to Democrats in 2024. Particularly, it's put it, it puts Democrats on the back foot for the internal contradictions of their own coalition. And it forces, you know, I listened to the New York Times podcast, The Daily, and I was, it was just remarkable amidst all of Michael Barbaro's weird groaning <laughs> and, ex, you know, eruptions, how quickly an <laughs> illegitimate issue can become legitimate if Democratic politicians, but really black politi- Democratic politicians, take it and say it's legitimate. Then all of a sudden, It is like a live question for Democrats to grapple with in a way that it wasn't even a few years ago. That's a good conversation for Republicans. But Chris, there does seem to be a limit to sort of Democratic Party officials grappling with this. And that comes on the national level. So if it's in their backyard, they sort of find Jesus on law and order kind of issues. Why is it so difficult for Joe Biden to sort of uh, take charge and and look Clinton-esque? on this current law and order issue, which is which is migration. For 20 years or more uh, after the failed mental health reforms in the 1970s and early 1980s, there was a common practice of shipping the mentally ill out of your town, right? Uh, onto communities with better services. And here's a bus ticket. And you can't stay here in Paducah anymore. But if you get up to Columbus, they've got good, they've got good stuff. Uh, Tampa was a popular destination and became a gathering place uh, to try to seek uh, better services in better weather. And the idea of moving uh, unwanted folks out of communities and into other communities 
Uh, there was the orphan train that they ran from Hell's Kitchen and the tenements of New York uh, out into the upper Midwest. We have, there's, a, there's a long history of this stuff. Joe Biden, we have to remember, is perceived by many in the Democratic Party as being too tough on migrants. He is perceived by, I don't know if it's the majority, but certainly a very vocal number of Democrats as being the successor to Barack Obama's deporter-in-chief. If we remember early days, this, the, the photo of the Border Patrol uh, officer riding with his long reins in his hands, they're whipping the, board, they're whipping the migrants at the border. Uh, the the carry-on of so many Trump-era policies, even if they're by different names, under Biden is anathema to many Democrats. They don't like it. So the question for Biden is, will he be able to, or will his administration and campaign, and so far as those are two different things, be able to, after Super Tuesday, embrace a more uh, restrictive, and so he will remain in the push me, pull me. The broader electorate wants control. They want enforcement of existing laws. That's what they want. Uh, Democrats, Republicans taken together with independents, you're looking at 70% or more of the electorate wants stricter control. And Biden has to worry about depressing an already depressed progressive base by going, by being perceived as going too hard. And it's a very, this is a very tricky dismount. Well, finally, let's look to an anniversary, 22 years since the September 11th attacks of 2001. It's, I mean, I, I say this, I think this every year. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe it was 20 years. I couldn't, I can't now believe it's 22 years. At the same time, it, it feels so far away and, and all of the uh, issues that came out of those attacks. Certainly the politics feel like they were from uh, another planet from where we are here in 2023. Steve, talk to us a little bit about what you're thinking about as we come up on uh, September 11th, 2023, and we look back to September 11th, 2001. I think that the, the main thing as I look back on 22 years um, after the attacks is the state of our politics. We just had a relatively substantive discussion about a pretty serious policy issue with no easy answer in the, in the migrant um, situation. Uh, there are other substantive policy issues that occasionally get attention in our national political debate, but not much. Mostly our national political debate is shit, honestly. It's performative politics, people doing things like reading Dr. Seuss, people uh, taking shots at one another on non-substantive things that will get the basis of the the two political parties riled up, and we're not actually spending enough time talking about serious issues, including uh, threats to the country, uh, external threats to the country. Um, if you look back on the steps that were taken to address the threat from jihadist terror, many of them were successful. Um, people can disagree about the wisdom of the Iraq war or the length of time that we stayed in Afghanistan, but certainly the hardening of the target here in the homeland made us much less vulnerable. Um, and I think some of the steps that we have seen clearly in retrospect were successful, particularly when you remember the, the, the days and weeks and months after the 9-11 attacks and the inevitability, we thought, of follow-on attacks, chemical and biological weapons, what have you. I think looking back on that, if you think about the, the days and weeks and months before the 9-11 attacks, Remember the kinds of silly conversations the country was having at the time, and then this sort of huge strike of reality hit us. I worry that we are going through the same process again with all of the, the kind of silly conversations that take up so much time in our, our political discussions in the country, and we're not paying enough attention to real threats. Still, uh, I think a residual jihadist threat, but threats from places like Iran and North Korea and China and Russia and others. Jonah, if you could talk a little bit about 
where 9-11 fits into explaining where we are in 2023, because it seems like uh, a lot of our conversation about this populist moment in the Republican Party, where things are in the Democratic Party, uh, we trace it back to the 2008 financial crisis. But uh, in 2001, uh, the September 11th attacks really have, have shaped, it seems to me, so much of our expectations for national unity, our expectations for where the policy debate ought to be, uh, where it is now, as sort of Steve alluded to, where it has been debased Talk to me about what, you know, where that conversation should be, where 9-11 fits into where we are today. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I'm not sure we have the, the space or time. And listeners should know we are not ignoring Chris Starwald. He had to run. And I'm thinking maybe I should write about this because I, I do think it's an interesting topic. It does seem to me that a lot of things that seem peripheral during the war on terror moment, which was a long moment, almost a decade, we could call it. A lot of the things that seemed like sort of ugly byproducts, but not sort of central to the narrative, were really sort of foreshadowing of where we are now. So first of all, I think 9-11 more than any other event in our lives, I mean, technology is a huge signal boost, but that's a different point. In terms of events, I don't think there's any other moment in our lives that unleashed a bigger wave of conspiratorial thinking than 9-11. On the left and on the right, and in different ways. Inside job, neocon cabal pulling strings from the inside as they, you know, they worship Leo Strauss. All of that stuff was, was birthed on the internet in the wake of that. There was an enormous amount of populism that we didn't really recognize as populism, that some of it boiled down to like boob baby stuff about Koran burning. Chris, if you were still here, he was making this point yesterday about how, or anybody just making it today as well, about birtherism sort of being one of these undercurrents. Birther, but for 9-11, you don't get birtherism, right? Because birther, the, the whole, the Muslims are these, you know, sleepers amongst us. They're, they're dangerous other, um, is born of 9-11 for psychologically understandable, if not necessarily um, laudable reasons. And... And so I think there's a lot of things on the politics side that come out of all of that. I also don't think you get the tea parties were it not for all of the spending that didn't seem to buy what we wanted, which was clear victories and better nation building than we got. This, you have the sense that conservatives held their nose for a very long time about a lot of spending. And then you have the financial crisis and you have Rick Santelli doing his rant talking about paying for other people's mortgages. And that just, there's a lot of kindling from 9-11 that I think that went into that. At the same time, I, 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 I think it's really, it's pretty fascinating how if you go issue by issue, if you make like a sort of a Chinese menu of different issues in our politics, and you look at where, which side of the menu, right or left, they were on in the wake of 9-11 versus now, Right after 9-11, the left ran full tilt towards defend the First Amendment, defend free speech, free speech is under attack, because it was a safe harbor ideologically for them. It, was, it fed into their paranoia that, that if they were going to criticize the war, they'd be shut down. And it was the right that was like, you know, not necessarily rallying around free, you know, rallying against free speech, but sort of making fun of people for being paranoid about the threats to free speech. Um, and you can go down a long list of those sorts of things where, like, now the right basically has the, I would argue, neo-isolationist or at least anti-American view of America's role in, a wor in the world that was so powerful on the left back then. And it, it shows you how much of political, how many sort of political faddish positions that are the product of populism are not actually connected to the ideological commitments of the parties that they, they find themselves in. It has to do with other things going on. And um, it's, uh, you know, if, if you could play back the clock and the wars went better, I think our politics would actually be a lot more healthy, but you can't do that. And the wars didn't go particularly well. We are where we are. Well, to go back quickly before we wrap up here on your conspiracy uh, element of, of what you said, Jonah, I mean, I think back, again, I was a teenager when 9-11 happened. I was sort of, uh, uh, became enmeshed in 
internet culture, um, as, as most people around my age did in the years following. And it, it didn't really occur to me, occur to me until we were just talking of how pervasive, uh, those kind of conspiracies were on the internet in those early days. If loose change was, something that every teenager and college student in in the 2000, uh, in the aughts, uh, knew about. Even if we laughed at it, we thought it was crazy. Loose Change was this, was this very conspiracy-heavy internet video that eventually got on YouTube when YouTube was created in 2005. I think it kind of came out at the same time. Uh, and it, it was a thing that everybody knew about. And for somebody like like me or for somebody who, you know, uh, didn't buy it. It was this kind of fringe thing that existed. But uh, I think had I been, had we been a little more uh, attuned to what the conversation was going on on the internet in the early days uh, uh, of, of that, that we might have foreseen where things were going a little better. Um, that the fact that it, it was so pervasive in the culture um, that that sort of, consp- you know, this leads to what Ron Paulism, this leads to uh, all of the, I mean, you can see it branching on the left I- into uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, afterward and just in the, the, the way that the sort of the forces, big forces uh, in the government, in, in, in business, in media are, are sort of uh, uh, sort of shaping things. Um, it, it to me, it's- yeah. We just passed. Just to point out, uh, I'm just you're, you're reminding me of this. We just passed the anniversary of Katrina, and people forget Spike Lee and a yes. whole bunch of other sort of Daily Beast types gave credence, not necessarily endorsement, but gave credence and oxygen to the idea that the levees in Nor- New Orleans were blown up by the Bush administration to kill black people. That's right. And that kind of thing would not have been given oxygen prior to 9/11 the way it was. Yeah, I mean, it's such a cliche to say we were sort of robbed of our innocence on 9-11. Um, but, and I and I think it's real, but in a way it was, it, it robbed us of too much innocence in, in a way. And, and we, we sort of became culturally, uh, uh, you know, susceptible and gullible for all kinds of conspiracy theories like that. That's, that's something I just, I think would, we should parse more. I don't know, Steve, if you have any final thoughts on this. I, I think I think it's the timing. I think it's the combination of 9/11 and this sort of deep desire to have simple explanations for the inexplicable, combined with the technology to propagate those simple and you know, often misleading or sometimes made up explanations that accelerated what was an ongoing trend. I mean, I think the Spike Lee point is a good one. Even before that, you had. The, the, the rumors, the prevalent rumors about the CIA distributing crack in urban neighborhoods um, to kill to kill blacks, you know, certainly conspiracy theories and this conspiracy mindset aren't new, but I think the combination of um, such a devastating, um, world-changing moment like the one that we experienced on 9-11 and then the... the um, the, the sort of grasping search for an easy explanation after that, combined with the technology to to make those easy explanations available at a click, is really what accelerated these these trends um, and have left us in this place where I think it's just, you know it's very difficult. You you um, have people across the political spectrum who are skeptical of any and all explanations for, you know, not something as big as, as 9-11, but something simple. But I think if you look at the, the way that, um, you know, some people talked about COVID, there were echoes, I think, in the conspiracies about COVID from the, the kinds of things that we saw in the aftermath of 9-11. It's this massive thing. It's hard to explain. People can't quite get their 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 head around it and you know i i had conversations with people both people i knew and people uh unfamiliar to me until that moment who claimed that this was all just an effort to get uh joe biden elected president um and you know you ask them how that explained the the excess deaths in spain 
They couldn't really give you an answer. They hadn't thought about it, but they had their simple explanation. And those things now, of course, rocket around the internet and they provide easy answers for people on difficult questions. Well, if I can sort of close us out on maybe a less dire and dismal note about 9-11, I mean, to go back, Steve, to what you were saying at the beginning of this segment, there were there were victories, there were policy victories in the wake of 9-11 that prevented further attacks like that. Um, and it's not to downplay the mistakes, it's not to downplay the loss of life in other places, but just to, you know, you know I think we should also reflect at this time in ways that we so often do, we, we don't appreciate how things could have been so much worse um, because of actions that the government took, the actions that, that voters took um, to, to elect uh, officials who would keep us safe. And, and that was such a uh, sort of a byword in that post 9-11, you know, in, in, in our politics, you know, Bush kept us safe. We got to keep us safe. And, and, and frankly, we are safe. There are all sorts of other problems that have come about. But, you know, we talk about uh, the pandemic. We talk about even the 2008 financial crisis. Things went bad. Things, mistakes were made uh, after those as well. But um, in some ways, uh, those, uh, the, things could have gotten a lot worse after uh, the financial crisis. Things could have been a lot worse with the pandemic, we could still be dealing with it. There's a question of whether it's back, but I think obviously things are so much better than they could have been. So maybe we should be a little more optimistic uh, as we close out and, and reflect. So, <laughs> all right, well, that's how we're going to end <laughs> effort to uh, inject hope into this podcast. Uh, sign up to be a dispatch member, uh, thedispatch.com, and uh, we will talk to you next time. That was really weird. That was very strange. Have we lost Steve Hayes? I think that my the ghost of my punditry has come through. <laughs> it's the ra- it's the rapture, but the cho- but the chosen or the bearded. It was like the punditry version of the ring. That's <laughs> um, a movie, Steve. It involves stuff coming out of TVs. <laughs>